second uh, of our series here tonight, our summer series, and Brent Moody is here with us, preacher at the Decker Prairie Church of Christ. Brent married Katie, has four children, two of which are here, Chelsea and Josie, uh, and two boys, uh, Titus and, and Xander, and they weren't able to be with us tonight, but I think we're going to pop a, a picture of their of his children up here there you go there you go up on the screen Brent did his undergraduate work at Florida College um, got his undergraduate degree there and then he moved on to a Harding University and got his master's degree in New Testament studies I think I have that right um, while he was preaching in Memphis Tennessee at that same time he was involved in in uh, getting his master's degree Many don't know that Brent and I are kin. Our grandmothers were sisters. So uh, we have a, a close relationship, uh, not only from that standpoint of family, uh, but also our work together uh, for the Lord. Brent's father, Tom Moody, was a talented gospel preacher. Um, I miss Tom, uh, great man. Uh, but uh, Brent came from good stock, and I think you'll see that. Brent is well studied. He's a classroom teacher. He's a good preacher, and he's a great worker in the kingdom. We're blessed to have Brent and his children with us tonight, and we look forward. I look forward to what he's prepared. Let's go to God in prayer. Jove, our God and our Father, you are the only true and living God. You are creator of all we see and all we know. There are no other gods before thee. You have fashioned men and women after your image and in your likeness, and you are in complete control of all things with an indescribable love for all of this world. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to listen to your perfect word proclaimed. May it fall on good hearts, root and grow for your honor and your purpose, Thank you for our Savior that makes us one of yours, grafted into your family, allowing us to call thee our Father who art in heaven. In his name, Jesus Christ, the Savior, we pray. Amen. What well, was my plan this evening for my whole family to be here, but plans don't always work out uh, like you'd hope. Um, Xander had a little bit of a fever um, tonight, nothing major, but in the 99s, and then he kind of got over 100, um, and I really wanted him to be able to be here, my whole family as well, but um, just so you could kind of put a face with the prayers, and I really do appreciate all the prayers for Xander um, over these past few months. They mean a lot to us. Uh, and particularly, um, I really appreciate all the work and the effort that was put into the cards that were sent to Xander from this congregation. Uh, I think I noted, if any of you are on the Facebook updates page for Xander, that it seemed like this church and Memorial uh, Church of Christ were kind of in like a competition for the best uh, card creation. Uh, it was pretty amazing, and I enjoyed looking through those. We, we spent a few hours actually one night just opening card after card, and y'all's cards stood out. Um, they, were, they were great. I enjoyed um, reading through them and all the work that was put into them. As the Steve mentioned, uh, we go way back. Um, the way we actually found out we were related was pretty amazing. Uh, I was, his uh, brother-in-law was my roommate at Florida College, and we grew up together. I mean, I don't even know, probably nine years old, we were at Florida College camp together, and we were best friends, and we ended up being roommates. And so I went up for his um, wedding, which was days after my father died. Um, and so that was just a nice time to be there and with friends. And we, we went to play a round of golf before the wedding. And Steve and I were paired together in a cart. Uh, and you probably can't believe this, but Steve was talking a lot with me. Uh, we were chit-chatting, and somehow we found out in that conversation uh, that our grandmothers were sisters, which was kind of amazing. And so I remember getting back to uh, Muffy's parents' house, and we were on the phone with my 
mom and others, you know, we're related, you know, it was pretty, it was pretty funny. And, uh, so that was great. And then we moved here and Steve and Buffy were um, just really huge for us. Uh, we lived in Pasadena. Um, some of you remembered me coming here before. That was kind of amazing. It's probably 18 years ago, the last time I was actually here. Um, but we used to come over and, and Steve and Muffy would take care of us. When we were newly married, they would make us filet mignon with bacon wrapped and all kinds of great stuff. And um, that, that was pretty great. We weren't eating all that well back then. So that was nice uh, when they would do those things for us. So they've meant a lot to us um, over the years and just really good to be here with them. Uh, Daniel and Beth, uh, y'all are amazing. I love you guys. Daniel and I worked together for a little bit. Uh, just a super impressive young man. Uh, I feel like I learned more from you than you learned from me. Um, just so many things, and you just have such a good upbringing. Your father's here tonight, and um, Embry Hills just does such a good job teaching their people. And I saw that working with Daniel at Climbwood. Uh, and I, I'm serious. I, I take things into the classroom now that I learned from Daniel. He was there to train at Climbwood. Um, but time budgeting and things like that that I saw Daniel doing have been... Um, Part of what I do when I teach classes. I've got five minutes for this and 10 minutes for that. And um, so I, I just, I, he, he used Google Slides. I didn't even know what that was. I was like, what is this you're giving me to look at? I don't know. But then, you know, uh, he kind of brought me into the modern world of, of technology. So um, all these things, just so, so good to be with you tonight and to open the Word of God. And I, I want to get into that. I've been studying through Romans, and particularly, I've been preaching through the book of Romans at home, uh, doing about a chapter uh, per sermon. And Romans 8, though, was a little different. I'm, I'm about four sermons in on Romans 8. It's just this centerpiece, in many ways, not just of the book of Romans, but just kind of everything. Paul just he packs so much into this chapter um, it's quite amazing just to take the time to work through it, and I, I wish we had time to go through the entire thing, which we don't just in one session. But there's a, 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 session, a section right in the middle that I think really needs some attention. Uh, it meant a lot to me working through it with the struggles that we've gone through in our family um, recently with Xander um, and thinking about the world around us and the evils that are in the world and the suffering that we go through. Uh, so this section in 26 through 30 really stood out to me a lot as being extremely important for a number of reasons. The first of those is that it's really hard to understand what this means. You know, this section, which we're going to read a chunk of this here in just a moment, but it, where it says here, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groaning too deep for words. You know, what does that even mean? You know, what's the Spirit actually doing? I mean, these are the kind of questions sometimes we have when we get here, and how does this fit in with everything else that's just been talked about in Romans 8. We're talking about walking according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. And then all of a sudden, Paul's talking about not knowing what to pray for. Why is he doing that? Um, so it just it's sort of a strange, incongruous, seemingly incongruous sort of text here when we get there. And it's one that we sort of know pretty well because we're, we're familiar with the phraseology. But then how does it fit everything going on? And, and that's what I really want to spend some time with. Uh, tonight, and just thinking about the text itself, what's going on here, and what Paul's trying to explain, to the best of my ability. There's no way I'm going to be able to get into the depths of this um, tonight, but I want to read beginning in verse 18 and following um, down to about verse 30, and we, we, we can't get to the rest of it. Um, if you are interested, you might be able to find them on the Decker Prairie website, more sermons that relate to this. But let's begin reading in verse 18. It says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. 
For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Before I, I move on talking about the main body of the text, I want to kind of show why Paul's talking about some of this. And, and of course, the place to do that is the preceding text, because it all sort of flows together. And what he's been doing here all through chapter 8, I mean, he begins with this idea that there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. It's the answer to chapter 7. In chapter 7, there's no hope. You, you want to do right, and you're trying to, to do right, but you just can't overcome it yourself. And the answer to that, he actually gives at the end of chapter 7, when he says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, this is the answer. And then he says, no matter what, you're condemned without Christ, right? He's already made this point all the way up to this point in Romans chapter uh, 1 through 7, that if you're a Gentile without Christ, you're condemned. If you're a Jew without Christ, you're condemned. None is righteous. No, not one. That's chapter 3. And so the point he's making here is it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, and he's really working to try to get these two groups to come together, and there's a whole context of that. Jews are probably going to be coming back into Rome, and he's trying to kind of get ahead of that a little bit, I think, and get them working together. But he gets to this point in chapter 8, which is going to be the summation of this main argument that goes from 1 all the way to the end of chapter 8. And the point here is that there now is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And if you walk according to the Spirit, you're going to please God. If you walk according to the flesh and you set your mind on the things of the flesh, you cannot please God. Right? Those are the, the two directions to go. And of course, this goes back to chapter 5, when he talks about the first Adam, and he talks about the second Adam. Right? Another puzzling passage that I love. But basically, the idea there is, it, the end of five, there's the first man, Adam, that we were a part of until we died and we were resurrected to newness of life, and now we are part of the Christ humanity. So you can choose. You can be part of the Adam humanity that's laden with sin, and there's no answers, or you can be part of the Christ humanity. And you do that by dying with him and be resurrected with him to newness of life. That's chapter six. Right? Chapter seven has its own unique passage that we won't get into uh, tonight. But the idea here is now that you're living according to the Spirit and you have this, this new life, there's, there's no condemnation, but there's a problem. What about the world around us? You know, we have this new life, and we're a new creation, but the world's a mess. Right? And people are sick, and people are wicked, and evil, and bad things happen. How do we wrestle with this reality that we see around us? And Paul's going to do some work with this, as we actually just read here in part of this text, that part of what's happening here is that God does have a plan. God is working things according to his will to accomplish the redemption, not just of our, our souls, right? But actually the redemption of our bodies is how he says it here in Romans chapter 8. And not just we ourselves, but he's going to redeem the entire creation that's been subjected to futility. So there's, there's some allusions here to the story of the fall and how the world itself is subjected to futility. And Paul's working with some of that. And, and part of this is, yes, he's not trying to deny the difficulties in the world and the evil and the suffering and the problems of the world. Paul's not trying to work around that or ignore that or act like if you're a Christian, you just pretend like everything's okay all the time. That Paul's not interested in that. Actually, quite the opposite. When we look at the world around us and we see the things that are happening and how bad some of these things are, it only should make us long that much more for what God's trying to accomplish through his people. His people who are with and are going to reign with his son. Now, notice the terminology that happens in 12 and following as he's kind of pulling all this together right before we read. He's saying we're no longer debtors to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. He sort of already talked about that in the preceding verses. Um, if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. Right? That's not good. 
You don't want to be the, in the Adam humanity. That's a way that leads to death. Right? And he made that point in chapter 5. Adam sinned, brought death into the world, and those who are a part of Adam die. Christ, through his one righteous action, brings life. And grace reigns through life, he says. That's the transition. That's what we want. Okay? As he continues on, now he's going to use some imagery that's really connected to Exodus. We are led by the Spirit of God if we're sons of God. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. And he's kind of pulling on some of this Exodus language here. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. And here's where we're kind of really want to hit on right now. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We are going to be fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. The gospel message is not that we kind of muddle through the dirt and kind of get the sins off as much as we can, and then somewhere along the way we get rid of them and we go to heaven. That's, that's not what the gospel is. The gospel message is that we ultimately are going to reign with him. We're going to be fellow heirs with Christ Jesus. We are going to be glorified with him. This is God's plan. Provided we suffer with him. And then he goes into what we just read. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed. So, beautiful text there, all about the reality that there's going to be suffering in the world. Right? And, and the way to view this, he uses some different um, symbols here to think about this. You know, the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth. Right? Th that's an image he's trying to paint for us. Like, we understand uh, men, we even understand this as we have our, our witness to it with our wives and how they go through this, that this is difficult and it's hard, but in the end, when they hold the baby, there's something on the other side of that that's glorious and wonderful. But the reality is, we are in the labor pains right now. In this temporary world, in the existence that we are in now, the way Paul's describing that is, it is the labor pains. We haven't gotten to the childbirth yet. That's going to happen. It's not just the whole creation that's groaning, and this word groaning just keeps popping up all through the text, including 26 and following, which we're heading toward. It's not just the whole creation that's groaning, but we are groaning. Even though we have the first fruits of the Spirit, right? And I think this is extremely important for us in terms of how we think about suffering and difficulty. And I want to get to some reasons for that here in, in a little bit. But I think it's vital for us to understand that this is just a, a regular part of life. We know the story of Job and what he went through, but it seems so separated from us sometimes. And, and sometimes we even make people feel bad for looking at the world and recognizing how bad things are and grieving and having sorrow over that. And I think that's a mistake. And so the place I want us to start here in thinking about this tonight is just to realize that when we face darkness and evil in the world, we have to realize that it is okay to groan in our weakness. It is okay to groan in our unredeemed bodies. This is really the point he's making just before this text in 26 and following. Right? He, he talks about the fact that we are groaning inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption. Adoption is a really big thing. Right? We're waiting for this adoption. The redemption of our bodies. Our bodies are not redeemed. We've only gotten the first fruits. Right, so we, we see the, the kind of the, the guarantee, right, is how he talks about it in Ephesians chapter 1. We've received the Holy Spirit as a guarantee, as a down payment, but we haven't yet received it in full. And we are living a new life in Jesus Christ, but in the midst of that, we still suffer and go through difficulty and we see darkness in the world. It hasn't all been brought to light yet. It'll happen. It's coming. But we don't experience it in full yet. And so in this life... We still go through difficulties and sufferings. Groaning is something that we know. The whole creation's groaning. We're groaning with it. And to pretend that the Christian life is one where we can expect no problems is not to understand Scripture at all. 
More so, we should be hoping for this final redemption. We should be looking forward to this final redemption of our bodies and the whole creation, the coming of the new heavens and the new earth. And I'm not going to pretend to describe to you what that's all going to be like. I don't actually have to know. I know scripture tells me it's going to happen, and that's what I need to know. And, and God is doing amazing things and marvelous things that I can't even fully comprehend. He tells Isaiah he's going to do new things that would, we would tingle if we could understand them. This is the God we serve. We don't fully comprehend what he's doing, but something new is coming. And it's going to involve the redemption of our bodies, the things and the struggles, the problems that we go through now. Everything is going to be made right. That's what God's going to do. And it may not happen in the way that I want to or the way that you want it to, the way we imagine right now that it should happen in our finite human minds, but God is working something that we can't quite understand. But I want us to hold on to this thought as we progress forward, that it is okay to sorrow. It's okay to groan. It's okay to admit that the world around us is a mess. And let me just say that the answers to that are not found from other human beings. I mean, if you think your political party is going to solve the darkness and evil in the world, you don't understand how things actually work. I'm not saying we shouldn't be a part of good things and try to participate in them. We certainly should. But the answer is going to come from God and through Jesus Christ. And to the extent that we work with him and work for him in his kingdom, that's how darkness is going to be turned to light. Not because some other fallible human is followed and we believe that they're going to be the answer. How many times has that happened? And how many times has that failed? Over and over and over. But we have to start with this idea that it's okay for us to groan. Now I want to move into the text proper that I wanted to talk about. And this is this idea of the spirit helping us in our, our weakness. And I wanted to start with this idea of groaning and darkness and all this because I think one of the struggles that we have as Christians is we really want certainty. We really want to be assured that everything's going to be okay. And I, I think that certainly exists in some ways in Scripture. Uh, but N.T. Wright had, has a great uh, an interview. He had, made a great statement about this that I, I think is extremely profound. He's talking about sort of the way that we think about the world as, as Christians, kind of broadly. And he says, some say, well, if God is God, he must want us to be certain. Right? That's, that's the thought. Because we struggle with this idea, how can I be certain about things? And certainty is not bad. I hope that you're confident in, in certain ways. But this is what he continued with. No, according to the New Testament, because God is God, he wants us to be faithful. And being faithful means hanging in there in the dark as often as not. What he's getting at here is when we go through suffering and problems and difficulties, there's a lot of doubts. There's a lot of things we don't know. And there's a lot of things we're uncertain of. And we would like to have all those answers and we would like to have it be black and white and know it's going to be this or it's going to be that. And the reality is it's just everything in between and we just can't know how things are going to play out. And what God's really looking for is not that we can just walk around all the time being confident and being assured and being certain, although that's nice. The most vital thing is that we are faithful no matter what. That we develop a character, that we develop integrity with God to the extent that no matter what we face, no matter what evils are around us, we lay it before God and we say, I trust you. The just shall live by faith. That's what Paul says. That's the theme of this section in Romans, right? The just shall live by not certainty, not assurance, not knowing that there's this certain path to get to heaven. It's interesting that Paul actually doesn't really talk about heaven in the book of Romans. He does talk about the whole creation being redeemed and set free and God making everything right because God is the just and the justifier and that God is glorified when all of that takes place. He talks a lot about all of that. But sometimes our theology gets really focused, and I don't really don't like the word theology, but I'm going to use it in this situation. But our theology gets really focused on me and what I'm going to get. Right? If I go through these various things, then I get to go to heaven. Right? And I can be confident and certain that I get salvation. Great. Salvation is super important. And going to heaven 
if we understand what that means, is really, really vital. But the ultimate reality is that the point here is that God is glorified and that God's will is accomplished and that we're working with God, that God is working through us so that he can bring about his will. Ephesians 1, that's what it's all about. All the things that are taking place and happening, they're all to the praise of his glory. That's the the finality of all of this. In the end, Jesus is going to come back and return the kingdom to the Father. He is going to be glorified in the things that are taking place. And so certainty is not actually the key, it is faithfulness. It is realizing that he has the answers even if I don't know them right now. Which leads us to this statement that the Spirit helps us in our weakness. He helps us in our unredeemed bodies and our bodies that are groaning inwardly, awaiting something more glorious that we can't possibly comprehend in its fullness. Now, there's some neat things about this text that I think we should think about. You know, a lot of times we say, well, what is the Spirit's work? What is the Spirit doing? Well, here's one thing that we know the Spirit's doing. When we don't know what to pray for, he's speaking to the Father. He's interceding in this moment. When in our weakness we don't understand, and we live in uncertainty, and we don't know the fullness of God's plans or how it's going to work, especially within a world filled with darkness, we just feel the groaning within And it comes out in words that are inaudible. Have you ever been there before? Some of you have. Those of you who have been through real trial and real suffering, you understand this very thing. That there are times you don't even know what to pray. At the very moment we are struggling to pray, one scholar says, and have no idea even what to pray for. Just at that point, the Spirit is most obviously at work. God hears and answers the prayer which we only know as painful groaning. The tossing and turnings of an unquiet spirit standing before its maker, with the pains and puzzles of the world heavy on its heart. Let me give you a little hope in your unrest. I mean, we don't like that feeling, right? The unrest, not knowing what to say or not understanding what to pray for. But I want you to think about it in this way. The times that you feel the most confused and the most lost for words, or you are in your deepest grief, because remember, grief is okay. It's okay to grieve. It's okay to groan in our weakness and our unredeemed bodies. In those times... Paul says it's when the Spirit is most clearly active and working in our lives. And you don't have to feel it. You, know, you don't have to have some sort of feeling or experience or anything like that. Now, as emotional beings, sometimes we do have those kind of feelings. Like when you sing, have you ever had kind of your body tingles a little bit, or, or maybe you tear up because you emotionally are, are moved. I mean, we do that because God created us not just as information machines, but also we are emotional. And, and so sometimes we are moved, and we probably are in these moments, but it's not about, I experienced this or I felt it. It's more, it is about the reality that we know that when we don't know the right thing to say, when you are in the shower and you are weeping in your moment of darkness, the Spirit is interceding for you on your behalf. And God, the one who searches the hearts, this is like a title for him here that Paul uses, he who searches hearts in verse 27, he knows the mind of the Spirit. And so when you don't even know what to say, you're crying out to God and you have no words to express what you actually feel. The Spirit is there interceding and God knows the mind of the Spirit and the Spirit is working for you. And sometimes those moments are so dark and so painful that not only do you have groanings that are inaudible, but the Spirit himself 
has groanings that are too deep for words. Have you noticed that in the text? It's not talking about your groanings that are too deep for words. There's some bad things that happen. The world is a dark place. And what God wants and what he's trying to do is work through his people to bring light to the world. But the reality is there is darkness and evil and wickedness and bad things that happen all around us. There is chance. There is disease. There are problems. And those things are real and they happen. And sometimes they're so dark and deep and painful. When the Spirit intercedes, he intercedes with us with groanings that are too deep for words. The Spirit is in it even expressing words. But God knows the mind of the Spirit. And he understands. And so the next time you feel that unrest or confusion or doubt, realize God doesn't. He knows. He knows what I need. He knows what you need, even when we don't know ourselves. Even when we can't express that feeling or that emotion in words. To me, this is such a comforting thought. Because so often, I don't know if you've been there too, but so often it's like, I don't know the right words to say. Have you ever been there? I don't know how to say this prayer in just the right way or or phrase it with just the right terminology. It doesn't matter. When we don't know the right words to say, the Spirit is interceding. And God understands. And then the finality of all this, to kind of bring it full circle to the point of verse 17, that when we suffer with him, we may be glorified with him. He who searches hearts will glorify those who love him. Now, this is a verse that gets a little bit uh, tricky sometimes. Uh, it, in your version, I read it the way it is in my ESV, um, and I couldn't get into some other matters here that I think are kind of interesting, like the things we know and the things that we don't know. But here it says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. It's a, it's a difficult um, Greek structure here in this text. Uh, and I'm going to explain to you why I think it's translated this way, even though there are plenty of scholars who would translate it differently. I guess I'll say it that way. And, and there's, unfortunately, just some bad um, thinking, bad ways of viewing God that lead to this kind of translation. Now, the translation you can take, and you can, I think, view it properly. It's just a little awkward. Uh, And part of that, I guess, working at it just from the English side of things, um, it's strange that all things are the subject of this structural sentence. You know, all things are working? Like, that's strange. The, the, The center point of everything is God. God is the one working. And so, probably a better way to render this, and this is not just coming from me. Actually, the RSV, the old RSV, renders it. Um, this way, and there are numerous scholars who who look at this and say, this is probably a more accurate way to render this, so this is not just Brent's translation. Verse 28, Uh, yes, it says, for we know that those who love God in all things work together for good. So this idea like all things work together, all the things that are happening, they're just going to all come together and they're all going to be good. No. All things are not good. There is no situation or no circumstance in which the death of a child is good. It is not good. A debilitating disease is not good. Those things are not. They're not good. Now, can God use them and by his sovereignty work where good things come out of those things? Yes, that can happen. But they don't suddenly become good things, right? But when you believe in a world in which God causes everything, And he is the reason, and you have to make this idea that there's a reason for everything. Have you heard that statement before? And so all things work together for good, and so it's this sort of strange scenario where you take all the horrible things and mix them together, and suddenly they become good. No, it's more like in all things, God works for good with those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. And so the idea is God is going to work with those who work with him. Right? He's going to work for the side of good. He is on the side of good. He is not on the side of evil. And in fact, we kind of get that toward the end of this chapter when he goes in that whole list of things and how we're more than conquerors and nothing can separate us from God's love. God is on the side of good and he works on the side of good. But 
however you want to render this verse, I, I want to talk for a minute about what this doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that everything that happens to us is for a reason, and God's going to work that all out, and it's going to become this amazing thing in the end. Right? Have you ever heard the cake analogy? Kind of tries to push this idea. Here's an example of it. I like to compare suffering to making a cake. No one sits down and gets out a box of baking powder, eats a big spoonful, and says, mmm, that's good. And you don't do that with a spoonful of shortening or raw eggs or flour either. The tribulations and suffering in our lives can be compared with the swallowing of a spoonful of baking powder and shortening. By themselves, these things are distasteful and they turn your stomach. But God takes all of these ingredients, stirs them up, and puts them in his own special oven. He knows just how long to let the cake bake. Sometimes it stays in God's oven for years. We get impatient and want to open the oven, thinking surely the cake must be done by now. But not yet. No, not yet. What really matters is that the cake is baking and the marvelous aroma is filling the house. I find that people who trust God with their suffering have an invisible something like the invisible aroma of a freshly baked cake that draws people to them. As Paul put it, all things, all the ingredients of pain and suffering work together for good to them that love God. That is terrible theology. And let me tell you why. It is offensive to those who face real trials and suffering. Is God actually going to turn sexual abuse and murder and disease and betrayal, unfaithfulness of a spouse, the loss of a child, the loss of a young mother? Is he going to take all those ingredients and mix them up and then this wonderful aroma is going to happen? No. Now, if you believe that God's sovereignty means that he makes everything happen and you have to defend that belief, you have to come up with an analogy like this to somehow twist it all and make it seem like some horrible thing like murder or genocide or abuse is all for some reason that we can't understand. The reason is people are evil because they've turned from God and they've rebelled against him. And it is not him that's doing that. Just like it was not him that took the fruit from the tree and ate it. It was a human who fell and rebelled against his will. And so, yes, in some sense, there is a reason for everything, but it's not the way people mean. And yes, God is so sovereign and so powerful that he can take horrible and evil and wicked things that happen in life, and he can make some good things come out of that. But it doesn't mean that those things are suddenly good now and make this wonderful aroma before God. And here's what it actually does when we promote this sort of thinking. It gives false ideas about God that can cause those who are lamenting and who are suffering and sorrowing to feel like their faith is weak. Well, you, you just don't see how this is an aroma before God yet. Paul is not interested in anything like that. He knows that it's okay to sorrow and to grieve. To look at the world and realize that the world needs to be redeemed. That bad things are happening and it desperately needs God and it needs change and it needs people to work with God to pray as priests do, to come before the Father and say things need to change, to intercede for the evil and the darkness that are happening in the world and try to make things better. Not to pretend like it's all okay and it's all going to be this amazing thing because God can just mold it and twist it and turn it and now sexual abuse now is a good thing. No, that's not right. That's not the God we read of in Scripture. What this does mean, that in all things God works for good with those who love him, what it does mean is that God has a plan, and God has a purpose. And he works this plan through his people, and he's always working for good. And the suffering in the present doesn't change. It doesn't mean that suffering now is not suffering, or that grief is not grief, and sorrow is not sorrow. But it does mean as his people, we can cry out to him, sometimes groanings that are too deep for words. And we can say, God, the world is not right. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because right now it's not. But we want you to reign and to rule, but right now what we see is a rebellious people all around us working and doing evil. 
And if we could go deeper into this text, which we don't have time to do tonight, we could show all the ways in which Paul uses texts like Isaiah 40 through 55, referencing the servant, the servant who recognized that when he was doing the will of God, he was giving his back over to be struck and be beaten. And yet in all of that, he still trusts God through all of his sufferings. That's the point. It's not that if we die with Christ and are resurrected with him that the sufferings go away and we don't have, no, you will suffer provided you suffer with him in order that you may be glorified. Part of what happens in this process is we are God's workmanship. We are working for him. We are interceding on behalf of a world of darkness. We are crying out as we see the evils in the world and saying, God, your kingdom come, your will be done. Redeem this fallen humanity. Redeem this creation. Redeem our bodies. Make it right. Bring justice. It's not just go to heaven. We're not just holding on for dear life until that happens. No, we are crying out for God to rule and to reign. For him to overcome evil and darkness with light. And all of this according to his will, because this is all part of his plan. So Daniel or Steve can cover this in more detail later, but the end of this, where he says, uh, and whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And he goes to this whole thing about being predestined and called and justified and glorified. And people get all worked up about this. This is just, it's written before. God knew before. He knew his plan. He knew what he was going to do. Right? And this is not that God had chosen some people to be saved and some people not to be saved. That, that's not really it at all. In fact, it would make chapter 11 really weird um, when it says in verse 2, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Like if he foreknew them and that meant they're saved, of course. Like what's Paul talking about? But that's not really what this means. And so when we have an idea that it's just this whole thing about going to heaven and that's all we ever think about, and we're not worried about what's happening in the world and working according to God's plan, it does get a little bit confusing. But when we realize that God is actually working, he has a purpose and he has a plan for all of us to be working in his kingdom, it all makes sense. I mean, God knew before the creation of the world how he was going to do this. Ephesians 1 talks all about this. That people are going to be conformed to the image of his son. And in this conformity to the image of his son, they're going to be glorified with him. But there's going to be suffering along the way. And in that suffering, they're going to bring about God's redemption. You see how this is so much like the servant? I mean, we're familiar with Isaiah 53. But it's in Isaiah 50 as well. I actually, I actually alluded to Isaiah 50 earlier, verses 8 and 9. You can go read that later. But you're familiar with Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. What does he do? He, he doesn't give himself over to God, devote his life to him, and then hang on and wait until heaven. No, he sacrificially gives himself to God's purposes, God's plans. And by doing so, he brings about redemption. The sinful servant, so in Isaiah 40 through 55, the area, you actually have more than one servant. You have the sinful servant, which is then paired with the, the, the saving servant, or we call it the suffering servant sometimes. So go read that. You'll see who is deaf like my servant Jacob. <laughs> That's not talking about ultimately Jesus, if we're going to bring it to the messianic thing. No, his people were rebellious and evil and wicked, and there's this servant that he had a plan for them, and they didn't do it, right? But the suffering servant or the saving servant, he came along. He trusted in God's will. He went through difficulty and pain and suffering to accomplish the things that God wanted to accomplish. And that is what we are called to as his people. To be servants, to be active, to be priests, right? This is where the whole praying thing comes in. This is part of what priests did in the temple, and there's plenty of temple imagery going on here in the text. Notice it says in verse 9 that the Spirit of God dwells in you. The idea of God dwelling has everything to do with the temple. And this text in the early part is all about God dwelling in you. If the same Spirit that dwells in Christ that raised him up from the dead, if that dwells in you, you also will be given life to your mortal bodies. And the life that we're given is not one in which we just hold on for dear life and wait for God to take care of it. No, this is a life in which we serve him and we work for him and we are essentially priests in his kingdom, doing his will. 
so that in the end we will be glorified with his son. The world is still groaning, and we are groaning with it. But God is with us in our groaning. If you are sorrowful tonight, if you look at the world around you and you say, it's just not right, I want you to know that Paul did too. He looked around and he saw that things were not right. That's the point. That's the good news. The good news is the world is not right, but God is going to make all things right. And he's going to do it through his son, and he's going to adopt us as sons, and we are going to reign with him. Adoption, I want to close with this tonight. Adoption is actually an interesting thing. You know, in the ancient world, uh, adoption was kind of a glorious sort of thing. I think five of the first six emperors of Rome were all adopted. There's only one that wasn't. You're probably most familiar with Octavian. So Julius Caesar, it's his nephew, but he adopts him so that he can reign. And now once you understand, we talk about adoption, the adoption of sons. Yes, there is the, the kinship aspect, the loving aspect, the caring aspect. There's also the reigning, the inheritance. Right, You are children of God, and if you are children, then you are heirs. You are fellow heirs with Christ. And provided you suffer with him, you will be glorified with him. There is a glory that awaits. And Jesus says he has a place for us on the throne of God, where we will sit and we will reign with him. It's quite an amazing picture, isn't it? That is God's people, he values us that much. But in this life, there's going to be problems. And as his people, we need to know how to think about those too. How to handle those. How to not give up hope and realize it's not about knowing all the answers or knowing exactly what God, God's going to do. But putting our faith in him. That he will bring all of this to glory. Thank you.